I want to welcome everyone to the February the Cat monthly webinar. Uh, we are a little challenged in our current setup for checking the chat room. So if you have some questions, please go ahead and drop them in there and we will check uh, at the end of the session today uh, for any questions you might have. Also, uh, if you have audio, you can chime in. Megan did a sound check with us, so I think we're, we're good to go there. Uh, I'm David Alexander from the Cyber Infrastructure Enhancement Corps. And with me today, I'm very happy to say, is Brian Malosson. He is with the LACATS Tracking and Evaluation Corps. Uh, he's Assistant Director, and he's going to present today. I'm going to let Brian uh, take over and take over the title. Let me drive. Perfect. Okay. So today I, uh, I will talk about uh, statewide services and how to access them and in that context uh, in reference to LACATS. So what I hope to accomplish today be what do I mean by statewide services? Why would you need these services? Why do we offer these services? And of course, ending with how do you even access these services? So uh, starting with what we mean by statewide services. So with this, uh, there are a few different things to consider. I, I put them in two different categories when I talk about LACATS and statewide services. Uh, others may classify them a little differently, but uh, the first one would be uh, geographically. So with our 11 different organizations uh, across the state that make up the LACAT Center, uh, geographically, we're in Shreveport, we're in Baton Rouge, we're in New Orleans, uh, and those affiliates across that. So geographically, we are truly statewide in that regard. So we have community advisory boards in Shreveport, New Orleans, and Baton Rouge. We have clinical trials units in the same, Shreveport, New Orleans, and Baton Rouge. So geographically, we are 100% across the state of Louisiana. Uh, as far as services offered uh, in the other respect, so in contrast to geographically, we offer these services across the state. So um, if you see one of the bullets here, an investigator's location does not matter when we access these services. So an investigator, for example, uh, located in New Orleans can absolutely tap into services uh, that are in Shreveport. So whether it be community advisory board or health literacy uh, and such. So location of an investigator really does not dictate where these services or how you access these services. So really, um, you'll see later on when we talk about how to access our services, uh, it really geographically doesn't matter uh, unless it matters. So obviously, if you're trying to do uh, multi-site trials and things like that, the geographics are, are would come into play here. So, so that's what we mean when that's what I mean. That's how I see the the statewide aspect of this. So to give kind of an obnoxious graphic here to kind of illustrate um, where we are geographically and statewide is, is here. So the top graphic speaks to the institutions and where they're located. So Baton Rouge, Shreveport, New Orleans. But also the, the picture below is all of our uh, different cores, resources and cores, and the involvement across each one of these cities, across each one of these regions, and of course across each one of these organizations. Uh, so as you can see, uh, that the, we truly are statewide from the north of Louisiana all the way down to New Orleans and, and in between, uh, especially with the community advisory boards, our reach uh, throughout those regions are, are quite impressive. So, um, so when we talk about statewide, this is what we're talking about. So I won't go into great detail. Uh, I will point you later on on how to get more detail for each one of our cores and resources, but uh, just to kind of list them out and touch on a few um, even more statewide services, we're talking about biomedical informatics, biostats, the CTUs, community engagement, and so on. And again, to reiterate, as an investigator of, the, of a LACAT Center organization, you have access to all of these resources, all of these cores across the state. And if you notice here, we're not really pointing out where each one of these uh, services and cores are physically located because it doesn't matter. So if you need REDCap, it doesn't matter if that you're in Shreveport, it doesn't matter if you're in New Orleans, uh, we can absolutely help you navigate those, uh, those resources and cores and, and really just transcend the entire state. So a question we do get is why would you need these services? So a couple of things to reiterate when we talk about the statewide. So your organization may not have access to a particular resource. So 
you may be part of an organization that doesn't have a biostatistical department, or uh, you may not have a red cap instance at your institution. And that's where the LACAT Center comes in. So we have the ability to absolutely offer you these services, uh, no matter what institution you're from. And um, for example, if, if you do have a biostats core, but that biostat score doesn't necessarily have the skill set that you're looking for. Well, we have three biostatistical departments across the state that we can query and see if those skills are amongst those. And if they are, we can absolutely tap into those resources and utilize them. So obviously, if you're into or interested in a multi-institutional, multidisciplinary or multi-investigative uh, investigative project, LACAS is definitely where you would want to come and see what we can offer uh, because we're just that. We have CTUs across the state. We have investigators that uh, have expertise in many different fields that you could uh, tap for mentors or collaborations and such. Uh, another thing is you may be new to the clinical and translational research space. And we have a navigator. We have many different resources. Uh, that complement the navigator that can help you uh, learn more about just the clinical and translational space, or if you have specific questions on how to navigate IRBs, if you're uh, just into the clinical side, or if you're looking to transcend uh, some other spaces. Again, the LACAT Center, uh, we're here to actually help promote and, and really um, enlarge the space of clinical and transla translational research in the state of Louisiana. Uh, we do offer pilot projects, we offer training and educational tools, so much more. So uh, from the LACAT Center perspective, uh, why would you need us? Well, I hope you would need us for any one or many more of these things. LACAT wants you to leverage our resources across the state. We want to enhance your research. Uh, LACAT Center is not here to replace an existing service or resource at your institution. We're looking to complement, we're looking to expand, we're looking to enhance those, those resources to give you opportunities to expand your research. So, so why do we offer these services? So up on the screen, you can see this is our, our mission to encourage, support, and expand clinical and translational research through partnerships among both researchers and with the people we serve. So that transcends all of our cores, that transcends our community advisory boards, it transcends our training, our education, our, um, our pilots, our feasibility studies, you know, the funding opportunities and such. So again, to reiterate, when we talk about encourage, support and expand, that's exactly it. We want to complement the research and the resources that are already existing and help increase the critical mass of clinical and translational research across the state of Louisiana. So a big question we get is how do you access these services? How do you access the LACAT Center? So I'll jump here from this slide and actually go to our website. And this is one of many tools that we have, but specifically if you want to learn more about the actual center, our mission, what is clinical and translational science, the institutions that are involved. I mentioned earlier that there were 11 different institutions that make up the LACAT Center. You can learn about all of them here, our structure, so on and so forth. Um, any one of these, what do you call these drop down menus? Any one of these drop down menus here can really give you just a encyclopedia of information as it is about the LACAT Center itself, whether you want to learn about cores and resources, uh, specifically communication. So if you want to see how to contact the biostatistical core, you can see the makeup here. There's an email I'll send you here. You can email from the actual website. You can learn more about the core. Funding and training opportunities. I know we get a ton of questions about this. So we, we actually uh, announced several RFAs throughout the year, um, transcending many, whether it be a training, different training grants or uh, different types of pilot feasibility funding, so you can find this here. Uh, important for educational purposes, we have our toolbox where you can find various tool uh, tools and um, webinars and such across many different spaces of literacy, informatics, biostats, innovation, and so on and so forth. Um, really just a 
again, the Encyclopedia of Information here. Latest news about the, uh, about the institutions that are a part of the CATS, about the CATS scholars, about the CATS pilots, any news that pertains to the CATS Center, all can be found here on the website. Uh, really, take a take a gander, take a take a tour. Uh, many different pieces, bits and pieces of information that you can find here. So when we actually talk about requesting a service, so the website, the Cat Center website, is very informational. Uh, you can very much use it for a communication tool. You can use it for learning about the different funding announcements, the different opportunities, educational training opportunities, uh, webinars and such that, that really that the LACAT Center is really pushing and that is our bread and butter. Uh, but when we actually talk about requesting a service, requesting uh, information from a core, requesting a consultation, any type of service that the LACAT Center offers, we really... Um, I really want you to use this Spark request system. And, and Spark actually is an open source uh, software that MUSC has developed. You can see MUSC's emblem, that is why their emblem is in the top right, uh, has really created a really wide ranging uh, request tool. And uh, if I can navigate to it here. And much like the website, you really can, you really can uh, get a lot of information about the various cores and information, uh, but this really is where, this is your tool, this is your opportunity to make contact uh, about, make an official request that you want a service or you want to talk about a service, discuss possibilities, really learn more about this particular core. And, and in order to do this, uh, we really do, uh, we like this particular way and method like, like the Amazon, you can shoot some over to your shopping cart here. You can peruse services down uh, our catalog here. Learn more about each one of the service as you click through. Uh, what I'd like to focus on today, I, I'll pick on the funding opportunities and really specifically to the pilot grants program. Uh, so we'll focus on, on going ahead and making a request for a pilot grant uh, application. And to start, I'll look up top, you'll have all these steps. So there's six steps from start to finish for you to actually make your request or service of the LACAT Center. So one thing we do ask is you do have an account. And if you do not have an account, you can sign up here and ask for your name, and ask for your email, and ask for your institution. Uh, it does ask for an explanation on, on why you're uh, wanting to have a user account. It helps us on the back end because we have to approve these accounts. Uh, so if we know why you're why you're wanting a Spark account, it does help us. Uh, doesn't not necessary. It doesn't stop you from getting or not getting an account. Uh, but we do ask that you utilize your institutional email or uh, whatever created an account. So I will go ahead. We'll learn more about this here in a second. So again, we'll pick on funding opportunities. So as I'm looking and shopping the different services and such, you know, as a pilot applicant wanting to submit a pilot uh, application for funding for review, you can see the various opportunities here. I'm going to choose pilot grants program. This particular, and I should point out that these funding opportunities are up to date. So if it's up on Spark. And this transcends all the services. If, if you see a service listed, all of these services are active. So there should never be a question for you that if you pick on pilot grants, that I wonder if this particular RFA is active or such. No, these are all active. Uh, these are all, um, I want to use the word real, these are all real. Uh, so if you add them to your card, you should receive feedback as you finish this and do the request. So again, we'll pick one here. So if you have any questions about the RFA, these links are clickable. Kick out over here to the PDF, give you the opportunity there. And most importantly too, we do have instructions on how to submit a, specifically a pilot applicant application. So that'll spit you out just in the PDF form as well. But 
we'll just go ahead and do it here. You hit add. It's going to ask you if this is a new research study or project in Spark. So this is specific to the Spark system. So if you have a project that's already existing but it does not exist in Spark, you're going to say that yes, this is a new research study or project in Spark. So you'll click yes. If the answer is no, so if you already have a project that is existing in Spark and you click no, this will direct you to your dashboard. We'll talk about dashboards later, but your user dashboard, and that, that gives you the ability to see all of the information that is uh, already entered in for your project. You can add or modify project information. You can add a service. You can delete services. Basically, you can manage that project through your dashboard. But for today, we're going to go ahead and say this is a new project. You'll see that it adds the 2019 multi-institutional opportunity to your shopping cart. One thing to note, specific to our pilots in LACATS, we do require you to have a biostatistical consultation before the application is officially submitted. So what Spark does is Spark automatically attaches this biostats consult to your service. So once you go through this system and you hit submit, you will 100% be put in touch with the Biostats core. So for those that are submitting an application, uh, say, after the fact, after you have done your Biostats consultation, it's just not in Spark yet, that is perfectly okay. You, you continue on uh, as you see fit, and if that consultation has already happened with the Biostats core, we, uh, as the Cat Center admin core, do keep in touch with them, so they'll let us know that they've done it already, and, and we'll go ahead and mark them up no problem. Uh, so just don't worry about the system adding it. Another note, too, is, is if you remember we talked about is this a new or existing study. If you have created a study and already added the biostatistical consultation, and you want to come back and add the pilot grants program 2019 multi-institutional grant funding opportunity, you can do that through your dashboard. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, when you select no, that'll send you to your dashboard and you'll add that service there. But I don't want to get, it's not get bogged down into that just yet, because we'll go back to dashboard later and I'll further explain that. But from here, if this, these are the only services that you're interested in today, then you'll go ahead and hit continue. So if you haven't done so already, it's going to ask you to log in. Let's see if I remember my password. Yeah. Look at that. Nice. <clears throat> okay, so it kicks you back here. Uh, you verify everything is the same. You will hit continue. So each one of these steps up top, you can navigate one or two ways through these steps. The first way is as you look at your information and fill it out, you will go to save and continue, or you can absolutely navigate these steps by clicking them. Now, some of these steps do have required information, so if you go too far down, if you skip too many steps, it will bring you back. Uh, so here, you're gonna create a new protocol, being that this is a new protocol in the Spark system. And from here, it's going to ask you for your protocol information. So we do have various informational hover over type buttons. So if you have a question about something, uh, most of these do have explanation and definitions. Uh, the stars do indicate a required field. Uh, most of these are required fields. Um, so, but if you have questions throughout any of this process, you should actually email spark.support at lacats.org, and we can absolutely help you in walking through this. So because this is a pilot project, this is actually a research study with defined aims and outcomes. So short title, test one, full title, test one. Over funding status, funding, not yet funding, potential funding source, the LACATS is a federal funding source. Is this a mentor study? We'll say no. And for the sake of argument here, this is human subjects. It is going to be a phase three 
These are not required. If I had that, I would. We'll do no, no, no. And again, I'll, I'll because this is a test, I will go ahead and throw in some test type information. Drug delivery, screen diagnostic. If you have a question, you hover over. State impact area, environmental. Answer. Project Association. So this is going to be a LACATS Pilot Grant Program Award. And it's just going to be me, so a single investigator, single, single institution. I will hit save, bring you back to step two. This is kind of a summary page here. One very important, important point to these SPARC steps is you have to have a principal investigator assigned to the project. So SPARC automatically creates you as a general access user. We will need to edit. If you are the primary PI, make yourself the primary PI. If someone else is the primary PI, you will need to add them. They will also need a Spark user account. Again, we can do this very easily, very quickly. Uh, so um, that's one thing to have ahead of time. And again, we can help you with this. We do ask for all of this information. Um, and I should point out all of this information is all required and all asked by the NIH. And uh, they actually do, we use the heck out of this information. Uh, and, and especially when it comes to things like has a user ever been awarded an R01 or not? So we utilize this uh, question here for all of our junior investigators. That's our distinguishable mark for who is and who is not a junior investigator. And especially when it comes to the disease state impact areas, they really want us to focus on certain disease state impact areas. So to be able for us to show that we're actually supporting projects and supporting investigators in those spaces, uh, it really is a plus for the LACAT center. So I've reviewed and I've updated in this step two. Estimated start date. It'll start today. It'll end next month. Save and continue. So service cal uh, calendar. Most of our services throughout the LACAT Center are actually a no cost. Uh, Spark system was built as both a uh, service request tool but also a billing and invoicing tool. Uh, so at this time, uh, right now on the live spark, there is no cost associated with uh, the consultations and the services that we offer. However, when you actually get in touch with the cords and services, if there is a charge or if there is a price to it, that is something that the cores will work out with you as you move through uh, your interaction with the cores. So here's a very important uh, step, step five. For those pilots, we're talking about adding a document. This is where you will add uh, your application. So you have the option here. Please select the type, application. As you can see, there's many different document types that can be chosen. For this example, we'll do application. Choose your file from the local machine. And you're going to allow access if it's checked the cores do have access to it. So if you didn't want, for some reason, the Biostats core to have access to that file, that document, then you can actually choose or unchoose them there. Now, this is something you can absolutely edit later. Uh, I should point out that 99.9% .9 of the information that you're putting into these steps, you can go back and edit later. So I hope that kind of alleviates some of the stress that we've had in the past for those that are, that are submitting. I'll hit close to that. Once your document is uploaded, you'll see it here. Any notes that you want to add uh, that can be seen again by the Biostats Core or the Pilot Grants Committee. Those are notes in Spark, right? Yeah, document. those are no, those are actually notes that stay that live inside of the Spark system. Okay. So anyone who has access to them can actually go back uh, into uh, this is like in the dashboard. We'll, we'll look at that later, and you can actually see the notes that are in there. Uh, those that have access to it. So if you're making multiple requests across, across multiple cores and you add that note, again, very similar to the document, you can choose who will see it. You can make notes within an actual request through your dashboard. And for example, if you and the bio statistical core are having a conversation back and forth, you want to put some specific notes for them. 
Uh, you can put it in there, they can view it, they can write notes back. Um, Spark can also be a tool, a communication tool. Uh, you can kind of do kind of, a, I don't know the technical term for it, but kind of inside mess messaging inside of the Spark system. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what that does is basically you send a, send a message through the Spark system. That user gets notified to go that their message resides there inside of the Spark system. And they go in and check it, and you can actually have that conversation. It's like internal Spark email, if you will. Hmm. If that makes sense. I know yeah. there's a different word for it, or a different explanation, but. Oh, yeah, it makes sense. But step six here another review of what you've submitted. And once you're comfortable, you can do a few things. You can get a cost estimate. You can save as a draft to come back later. Or in our case, we're going to go ahead and submit the request. So the LACAT Center does ask that for services that are rendered to every investigator, we ask that you uh, basically promise that you're going to cite the grant. <laughs> and so this is our terms and conditions. By agreeing here that you will basically cite the grant, uh, that hitting agree, we will actually officially submit your request. And if you would choose to do a very short system satisfaction survey, you can choose yes. We're going to say no for this, for this case. Brings you here saying it was all done. You can download your service request to, to Excel if you'd like, yeah. or go to your protocol and spit you straight to your dashboard. I'm actually going to skip this, bring us back to the home page, and talk about that dashboard option. So once you've logged in, if you remember from earlier, you'll see here that there's an option in the top left to go to your dashboard. So for those who only have a few studies, like this, like me in this case, you only see this one. But if you had more than one study, they would all be here. So you'll be able to click on. And as I mentioned earlier, you can view, you can edit your protocol details. You have the ability to add another authorized user. You have the ability to edit an authorized user uh, down to a service. You add modify request. So add services, modify request. So this button here will actually kick you back to the home page. Uh, your shopping cart will have these two services already existing in there. And if you want to add a service, you just go ahead and you start adding whatever different service you want. So if your particular pilot application includes uh, community engagement core, includes health literacy, includes red cap, and when you first submitted it, you either didn't realize it or you weren't sure or whatever, now you're ready to add that, you come here, you hit add services, you can add health literacy services, just like you would any others. See here, top 10 here, you go to continue. It will ask you to do the steps again, but you're not really, if you're not changing any of the details, you're just going to go through. You see it's all pre-populated with the information that you already had. Nothing new and different here. And then sure enough, save and continue documents. Submit request, you'll agree. And they're asking a lot. Yeah. So from here, go to protocol, and you're back to that your dashboard screen. So for those pilot applicants that wanted to get this Spark request done early, and your application was not ready yet, again, here in your dashboard, you have the ability to do the same thing as you did in step, in step five. Add your application here, choose the file, upload, and it'll reside here. One important note for all service requests, you'll see these statuses here. So once this email gets sent to the service provider, whether it be the funding opportunities, uh, pilot grants program, bias stats, health literacy, uh, they will go into the Spark system, they will assign an owner, and they should update this status to show whatever's necessary in process or completed or in the case of the pilot applicants, you have things like the application is submitted uh, or received. And an important note for the pilot group is once we've received your application, we will update the status to say that you will get an email notification confirming that your application was received. But here is your opportunity in the dashboard again to update 
all the information across the entire project is your chance to update to see where your individual services are. So if health literacy is in process and biostats is complete, then these statuses should reflect that. Hmm. You can update any documents uh, that you wish, uh, uh, any type of protocols, any type of applications. We just ask that no PHI be uploaded here. Uh, this is not the place for that. <laughs> Please. Uh, absolutely. So you mouse up the timeline. So essentially from here, this is pretty much your, your project management uh, space uh, for a LACATS service. And uh, keep in mind, too, uh, we talked about earlier from the notification standpoint that I mentioned, uh, you can send the notification to one person, uh, to all of them. Uh, from a notes perspective, uh, you can add notes uh, here on the dashboard. You know, pretty much just manage your entire project here. Let's see, work on notes, you can add notes. So, so of course, if you have any questions, you can email us here, contact us. It'll come through uh, the Spark system. You can email email us directly at spark.support at lacats.org. Uh, if you email info at lacats.org, pretty much reach out to anyone and uh, if you're having issues and everyone is very well informed and, uh, and well, I say well, very well informed. They have no issues giving this to me and we run with it. Finding me. Finding me. <laughs> no one, everyone knows where I am. Uh, so we will get your questions answered. We will get this taken care of. Uh, do not stress, uh, especially when you're submitting your pilot application. Uh, we will work with you. We will, we can work with you to get this done. Uh, we have the ability. So uh, let us know if you have any questions and we can knock it out. So I think that's um, our cat's website. Spark request. I do believe I will call it, call it it. That's it. Very good. <laughs> Great. Great. Well, thank you, Brian. That was a lot of information. I appreciate that. We will have that on the videos. So if uh, you saw something uh, go by that you want to uh, look, look into a little more deeply, we'll have that on YouTube uh, by the end of the week. I'm just going to check into the chat section and see. Great, so we have a question. Are these biostatistical resources for student and clinical residents slash fellow researchers? Sorry, I'm going to this. Uh, so Julie, actually, uh, I would say yes, they absolutely are. So biostatistical bio resource for student and clinical resident fellow. So uh, I will actually look more into that. I think the answer, for, especially for the fellow researchers, um, I know that for sure from uh, resident and students. Um, I don't see why not, but but I don't want to speak for the biostats core in, in that regard. Um, I know the three biostatistical uh, resources that we tap into are the LSU HSC New Orleans School of Public Health, the Tulane School of Public Health, and here at Pennington Biomedical Research Center. Uh, so I can direct that question. Uh, I will direct that question to those three entities and see what their answers are. I know we have uh, our criteria and eligibility for services is pretty broad in terms of a member, uh, uh, a member of any of the eleven LeCat Center institutions. Um, but that's about as straightforward as again. We do have priorities in terms of junior investigators. And I could argue that student and clinical resident fellow researchers are, are junior investigators. So, um, well, um, should we have Julie email info at cats.org? I think Julie should email info at cats.org. Matter of fact, Julie, I'll tell you what, even better, email, let me give you the biostatistical. Oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I think it's, so, info at cats.org as well as. I'm going to look it up. It's on the website. That's right. That's a good place to start. Tell you what, you get started and we can type in. I don't want to hold this up any longer. Uh, okay. We will type that into the chat on who you should contact. Great, thanks. Okay, well, thanks, Brian. Um, so I'm going to take over here now for um, Red Cap and SMS. So this is a topic 
that uh, came up just in the last few weeks. We were asked about some SMS capabilities and what might be available with REDCap. And so I posed the question, have you ever wanted to initiate a survey as an SMS message? And uh, what we've learned is that REDCap plus Twilio, Twilio is a web-based SMS service provider. Um, it equals something that's simply amazing. And uh, I know it's my Alex Trebek reference, Will Ferrell reference for today. Um, but it really is pretty impressive. Uh, we did not expect to see uh, the hooks and connections between RedCap and Twilio that are there. And so I thought I'd share this as a topic and see if you all have some questions because I thought it was very cool and definitely something you might be interested in using. So um, how does it work? Well, by enabling a survey, just any survey that you have in RedCap uh, to be delivered via Twilio SMS, you switch the entry point for your survey from the web to an SMS text message. Um, two different methods are available. I actually list three here, and I'll mention that one last. But the two methods are via a survey link or an SMS conversation. The, the third choice, which we haven't delved into yet, is an actual voice call. Um, and I'm going to leave that one, and maybe we'll cover that in a, in a future uh, webinar. But that actually would involve Twilio's speech-to-text function. So you'd have sort of a robotic AI-sounding voice reading your survey to someone over an actual phone call and then asking them to choose on their keypad um, answers to your survey. Again, that's going to be something we'll talk about in a, in a future webinar. But for now, I'll talk about these two SMS methods, so survey link and SMS conversation. And for the purposes of our demo today, I've just created this simple uh, baseball survey. So it's just choose your favorite pitcher, your favorite third baseman, your favorite sluggers. And you can see I've used different uh, different, uh, different controls, rather, so a drop-down list, uh, radio buttons, et cetera, just to show you how that would look. So let's pick up the first one, survey link. So if you deliver a survey via a survey link, you receive a text message that looks like what you see on the right hand side here. It just says, and you can control what this says, but this one to begin the survey, visit this link. So the message itself contains a link. Um, the survey, when you click on that link, you'll be taken to a browser on either your desktop or laptop or a mobile device, wherever you receive your text messages. And you'll be taken to the red tab browser session, which you're probably most comfortable with. Um, it's worth noting, in this case, no data is sent through Twilio except for the link. So this is probably a really good uh, use case when you want to capture PHI, right? Because the data does not go through Twilio. It, it, you, you're simply getting a shortcut to a survey in RedCap, and within that survey, you'll, you'll just interact with RedCap directly. Um, so like I said, it's a familiar uh, interface with all the expected behaviors about required fields and things like that that you would expect if you've done a red cap survey before. And so if your survey is very long, this, this is probably a good selection. If your survey uh, contains PHI, like I said, this will keep all the PHI on a red cap server and will not involve Twilio at all, just the link. So that's, that's the idea behind the survey link being sent. The other choice is um, called SMS conversation. And this is a slightly different approach, and I think it's fairly impressive. The entire survey takes place in SMS, so on your cell phone itself. All the survey text that you put into the survey gets rendered to SMS. So you can see at the top, there's a welcome message that I put in the survey. And at the bottom, you see the thank you for taking our survey message. And those all will come across as text messages as you work through the survey. Um, and then radio buttons and drop-down values are enumerated. So these did not have uh, these choices back in my survey a few slides ago. They didn't have these numeric choices, um, but RedCap did that for you. So uh, in the case of the first one, choose your favorite picture, number one, Raleigh Fingers, number two, Ron Guidry. And what's happened there is RedCap has enumerated this because it knows its target is, is a text message. It sent that enumerated code to Twilio. Twilio has sent this to you. Now you're going to respond to it, and that response goes back to Twilio and then back to RedCap in the end. So it does make a round trip through Twilio, 
Um, so you know, this is something good if you're using you know, non, you know, not PHI perhaps. Uh, this would be very good for a short survey. You know, something um, functionality such as branching logic is handled in here. So you could actually say, uh, would you like to participate in a short survey? Yes, no. If they say yes, then you take them into your survey with, with branching logic. If you say no, you can end the survey immediately. So there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, chance here to, uh, to to use this technology to to some interesting ways. Um, this is just a, an example. I'm, I'm sure you all can come up with some uh, better examples. But that's the whole idea of an SMS conversation. So we have these two paths, um, and then also notice that each of the uh, each of the choices, each of the questions in your survey is a separate text message. Uh, this is important to note um, because uh, we'll talk about that probably over the next slide. Um, each SMS message costs money, right? So uh, each time that you see one of those bubbles, it's about three quarters of a cent, so about, about a penny for each message. So you want to keep that in mind uh, when you're designing your survey. If you've got a 500 question survey, Maybe it's best to go with the link, right? Because it's one, uh, it's one SMS survey instead of uh, 500 pennies, if you want five dollars to send to send a survey like that. They can stack up. You'd be you'd be surprised how they stack up. So, um, so how do you start to use these? Well, you need to start if you don't already use Twilio. You have to set up a Twilio user account. Um, you'll need to set up a funding method for your Twilio account because they you maintain a balance on the Twilio site. To pay for these, and like I said, uh, there's a there's a three quarters of a penny charge per text message. There's a dollar per month charge for the phone number that that is actually sending the message to you, and you can have this in the area code that you need if, if you're trying to send text messages to uh, in other states, for example. Um, and then you're going to get some information from Twilio, which you'll need when you go back or your your RedCap admin when they, when they set this up. For your project, and that's your your SID, your auth token, and your phone number that you receive. Um, these are necessary um, for configuring RedCap, but they're also necessary per project. So you cannot set up a single uh, a, a single uh, Twilio account to do everything on your RedCap server. You can only enable a single project. Kind of a project. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Sorry. Switching technologies here, and I started thinking I was using the wrong term. So, per project, you can only have a single Twilio profile, if you will. If you want to have five projects on your RedCap instance using text messaging, you'll need to set up five phone numbers, um, all probably under the same Twilio account, but that phone number charge will, will, will move up. And this is good. You don't want to turn on, uh, as a RedCap admin, you don't want to turn on this feature for all projects and then see them suddenly your balance on Twilio goes to zero because everyone has used up all your money for text messaging. So it's tied to each project, each project that needs this, and it has to be enabled by an admin. So if this is something that you think would be of interest uh, to you in, in a survey um, uh, paradigm that you're envisioning, you'll need to contact your admin to enable this for your project, and then, and then you'll need this information. Uh, I bolded this uh, this comment that came right out of RedCap, and that is this uh, request inspector option inside of Twilio. What request inspector does is it actually creates a log of all text messages that are done on your Twilio account, and this is good for troubleshooting and for testing as you're as you're developing projects. Um, we use Twilio for some other projects here at the center. And so we've used this in the past to inspect the data that's going to Twilio. Um, but then it's best practice to turn this feature off so that nothing gets logged at Twilio, such as PHI. You need to, you know, if that were to slip out into a Twilio uh, service and get logged, that would, you know, unless you have a BAA agreement with Twilio, which they, they won't honor, they're called a conduit technology. Um, so this feature allows that conduit relationship to stay in place. You have, you have turned this off. RedCap will not function with Twilio unless you've turned off the request inspector uh, 
attribute on your account and it'll, it'll test this each time you revisit the project. So that's important as well to do and it's, it's a good safeguard. So once you've got all that straight, uh, you'll need to configure the Twilio settings. Um, and there are many uh, Twilio settings um, uh, with this with the Twilio interface. Um, the first one has to do with that voice call ability. You can actually change the language and gender used for uh, voice calls. So if you'd rather have uh, a male voice or a female voice, you can, you can change that as a default setting for radio or survey. Um, you can choose what the default survey invitation will be. That's the three types we talked about, link, conversation, or voice call. Um, you can always override that, but, but at least you can set a default. Um, the, the third bullet, automatically append response instructions, yes, no. That's what you saw um, happen in my baseball survey. It automatically appended one wrong degree to wrong fingers, those types of options. You don't have to do that. You can turn off automatically append and then guide the respondent through your label. So the label would say, enter one for this, enter two for this, and then you just have a drop down list and the survey would handle it. So this is just, this is just a nice feature. Again, the red cap always seems to go out of their way to have nice features. That's what that one is about. Um, choose the default invitation preference for invitations. I uh, designate a phone number field for survey invitations. This is if you have collected phone number data from another survey and then you want to designate that phone number as the one, that, that field in your, in your uh, project as the source for text messaging. Uh, you don't have to do this. You can, you can uh, when you um, manage invitations, you can actually specify a phone number, but this is a way to, to designate a phone number in your database. And then finally, there's uh, behavior for overlapping SMS invitations. This is um, how the text messages will behave in the event that you've uh, sent them more than one at one time. And, and we didn't really get too far into this, but, but there is a way to control it. Um, and and it will just require having multiple SMS invitations for the same time. So it's just another nice few that's there. And then finally, um, Probably you're wondering, would my survey work with uh, with SMS? And according to the documentation, we haven't tested every case, but um, the documentation says that most surveys function just fine. RedCap's giving you an analyze survey button uh, on uh, within your control center, so you can actually test what's existing in your project to see if if they'll work for SMS. All the cases we've done have passed the test. Um, so it's nice for them to give you that that uh, that testing ability, but I haven't seen one fail yet. So um, all of the uh, capabilities that I list there function within SMS survey. So required fields, field validation, branching logic, a survey queue, email notifications, and confirmation. All of those things which you might be using in your current surveys work with SMS messages. What does not work and is not supported is survey logging. And I haven't used that one either. If you remember on a previous webinar, we talked about um, save and return later and uh, using save and return later with a code. You actually have to get in our code. Well, this is, this is that other option where you actually log into RedCap again. And you think about it, it makes sense. You wouldn't want to pass credentials through your testing. So I think that's why they, they don't support that. Um, but, but, you know, that being said, it seems like almost anything that you would come up with could be used for this uh, in one way or the other. Certainly in the survey line, it's going to behave uh, the way you would expect. So, uh, so that's, that's uh, as much as I know, I, I kind of flew through that and it's a complex topic. Um, but I'd love to hear from you all if you uh, have used RedCap and SMS. Um, I'd love to hear about your experiences. Um, and I definitely would like to hear if you use uh, the red cap with voice call surveys because that that's fascinating that you actually get a phone call and I'd love to hear how the respondents felt about getting a semi-robotic type voice calling them about about, about your survey. Uh, so if you, if you have some experience with those, um, uh, please email us redcap at lickcats.org. Uh, and, and, and actually, this just reminded me of something else we saw in our, in our meeting that we had this week. We, uh, we, we found where uh, RedCap will actually read surveys to you 
um, so that you don't have to read what's on the on the survey in the labels and even in drop down values. Um, so again, just another impressive feature with REDCap. That might be something we we can dig into in a future webinar as well. But uh, definitely from an ADA perspective, or but there might be other use cases where you really want uh, the survey read to someone. Um, it is a it is a compelling feature, and it's right there in REDCap ready to use. So that might be another one that we'll talk about next month. Um, so that's SMS in REDCap. Um, I did have one other question to ask for opinions if anyone has any. Um, have, have any of you out there used uh, the REDCap Cloud offering? Uh, we we uh, we met with REDCap Cloud this week and, and learned about their product, and uh, it's really impressive. And so I'd like to hear if, if anyone's had experience using the REDCap Cloud product. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear about your experiences. If, if you contact me, maybe we can set up a set up an offline uh, meeting. I'm just curious about uh, about how you transition between the two, because uh, I think there's there's definitely a need for both the red cap, red cap with their calling academic and red cap cloud. It's, it's very impressive. So that is everything that I have. Um, let me check the chat session just in case we uh, no, didn't pick up any more questions. So Julia, I did email um, the group. I haven't received a response yet. Uh, if you would like to also follow up with them either through info at lacats.org or biostatistics at lacats.org. So that email will go actually will go to the exact group that I sent uh, as well. So you can double up on that if you'd like. Um, or reach out to info at lacats.org with your information. I'll follow up with you and uh, we'll get an answer. Great, great. Thanks, Brian, and thanks, Julie, for the question. Um, that that brings us to a close. Uh, we we're almost at the hour. This is this is a great uh, great webinar this month. Thank you, Brian. Uh, uh, and we'll have you back too. Uh, if, you, if you have any questions, if you uh, would like to provide some feedback about today, uh, you discussed on Brian for red cap feedback. But really, any of the cat's topic is is available. So. Um, there's a red cap survey where you can give us some feedback. Um, we have training resources for red cap available at that link, redcats.org slash red cap training. If you don't have access to an instance of red cap, but you'd like to, you can get a free one week demo at redcapdemo.vanderbilt.edu. That will allow you to kick the tires and see if red cap's right for you. Uh, we've plugged into our redcats.org lot today, but if you have any general questions, please send us there. Or red cap at red cap, or red cap specific, or really any of these, and they're all fine with because we, we okay. communicate really well. So, um, and then finally, uh, if you came in late or if you'd like to zoom in on some part of the video, go to redcats.org slash YouTube, and this video will be there soon. Um, and uh, and we will uh, we will adjust our March webinar to be uh, per your feedback. So let us know what you want to see covered. And uh, if we don't have any other questions in the chat, I think that will be. We'll sign off for today. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, everybody. Bye.